what I was saying was somebody that's influential to a certain area, either area okay. or a certain uh, genre, sub-genre, you know, south, east, west. Uh, to the game, we don't have to be anybody older per se or old school, but somebody that has changed the game um, in a in a certain way, uh, influence free thinkers or whatever. Like, for instance, you know, if it's a a Diddy or a Jay Z or a Master P or Ice Cube or Easy E, you know, their thing was they influenced the game in a certain fashion business wise, right? Right. Ice Cube was probably one of the first ones to get in the, uh, not just act. But start writing his own movies. Obviously, uh, Diddy, Jay Z, Master P, E Forties. These are guys who created their own record labels off the ground, and and created the format. You know what I mean? Before that, niggas was just having to go to the labels, but they created their own lane. Obviously, E Forty, Ghetto Gold, out the trunk. Too Short was really the first nigga pushing out yeah, the trunk. For sure. You know things like that. So in that in that scene, I, I in my mind, what really stands out as like a, a groundbreaking art uh, artist or group is outcast only because when I you know when I think about their their artistry in the game basic you know absolutely in the south they were I can't I can't think of any uh any artist or you know group duo that was as groundbreaking I would go as far as saying that hip hop duo that's number one. Like, there's probably, I would say, that there's never been a better duo in hip hop um, as a group. The Outkast? The Outkast. Uh, but then, you know, that's just me. But then I would definitely say, as far as artists go, that you know, they put the South on the map. They definitely, uh, they were, you know, there were artists before they UGK right. and things like that, but they definitely were the ones who, uh, who took that to the forefront and especially like I said there was that uh, I believe it was 92 at the source Andre 3000 got up and said you know the South got something to say because right. niggas was booing the South obviously just like Snoop did yeah, for Death Row Death Row yeah I think that was a year later that Snoop got up and you know the East Coast don't fuck with Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg well let it be known then and Snoop Dogg did that but Andre 3000 did it for the South because when it came down to hip hop at that era, like the nineties, New York was the pinnacle and they all, you know, that's where it began, that's the Mecca. Right. But they were hard on other regions. Like their what they accepted or what they allowed to be called hip hop right. was very few. Like at that point in time, the only niggas that they backed was like Ice Cube. Cause Ice Cube he did uh, took the East Coast sound. He took the he went yeah, he uh, bomb Chuck squad. D. Yeah, Chuck D and the Bomb Squad, he went over there. And so he, they were literally, he, Q was really the only one that they like certified and said, you know, fuck the Jerry Curls and the uh, Lolos and the Palm Trees, we only fuck with Q. And they took, they really held on to that, uh, that way of thinking for a long time, far, far after that. But when it came to the South, it's like they barely let the West Coast in. Oh, that was like, nigga, not your country, country nigga. Yeah. Hippity yeah. blue blind, hippity yeah. blue blind. Exactly, but Outkast came, put them on notice. Nigga, the South got something to say. They still didn't really give them a chance, but then now you go, you know, what, 20 years later, and shit, you be hard pressed to find any nigga on the East, West, or the South that don't include Andre 3000 and their right. favorite MCs. Or oh, shit, I mean, you look now, just think about people including Atlanta, period. I mean, and I don't even think all the artists out of Atlanta are even that hard, but I think the thing that makes them so significant is that. If one of them has a buzz, everybody in Atlanta for sure gonna support it. Oh yeah. At the end of the day, like they it's not even a, it's not even a question. Like everybody work or everybody. Sometimes I can't, I can't basically decide who is who because their voices be sounding so similar sometimes. But I mean, end of the day, it's, I feel like if you get your money, and if it's a if it's a demand, uh, in the market for what you what you supplying. And keep making that shit at the end of the day. Like, that's a, that's a craft, and that's how you want to put out the music and do it. Well, yeah, the South always they have, like, a different way of putting out music, different different sounds, different ways of, um, you know, saying words, obviously, just because of obvious dialect. But <clears throat> I think that uh, Andre 3000 and what's so significant about them, I would say, like, they both are actually artists to where, like, Easy e um, Ice Cube was writing about lyrics. So it's kind of like, you know, the effects, 
I was. He he's still alone by himself too though. But still, the effect really ain't all the way the same. Post like Andre and uh, Andre and Big I'm Boy. About Big Boy, they both had their own styles, their own significant styles, their own significant rap styles, and the niggas is both hard to this day. Yep. I mean, when you think about it though, uh, coming from like like really looking at how the West Coast progressed right. and the South progressed, kind of. Um, in similar fashion, when you look at them against like East Coast, East Coast was real hard. That beats were like samples and drums. So I remember once upon a time, the East Coast would say uh, beats were like secondary. Like lyrics were just everything. Right. And if a nigga would say like, oh, that shit whack because the beat was whack, the East Coast would be like, how the fuck could you say that? Like the beat is not even important. It's all right. lyrics. But then when you come with the West Coast and put the two together where you had to have dope lyrics and a dope beat, and then obviously in the same fashion that Dre went and got all the instrumentation and put together like the chronic, you got uh what was it, organized noise, um, that were musicians and they put together like the Goody Mob, right. Outcast, and then even went further and did like TLC and in Vogue and got Grammys. Right. But they so definitely that's like equivalent to like our fifteen hundred or nothing now. Exactly. Exactly. Those dudes were exactly that. They you know, the same bib and then they so they had they was a crew and they put out multiple acts like right. it wasn't just goody mob or outcast obviously they have solo you know CeeLo is a solo artist right. andre big boy they had other artists that was in the sleepy crew that they brown. put out sleepy brown and so future from that branch. And, and yeah future is like a that's crazy to even think that though, right. yeah right. and so they really had longevity when you think about it they but they literally put the south on the map for for credible, like you know, before that nobody could say that right. there was an act that was res worth the respect. But then when these two come, and then obviously they had a difference. So, of you, styles. so who would you say then? Trick Daddy put on like gangster music in the south. I would say yeah. He obviously there's a big difference between Miami and the rest of the south as they have their own bass music and things like that was yeah. just their thing. But Trick Daddy definitely Trick did. Trick Daddy from South Carolina though originally, but. But he definitely was representing Miami and ba that, you know yeah. that sound. He definitely came with uh, a different sound. But I would even go as far as saying like his success was definitely like piggybacking on. You know, I don't want to say that it was directly related, but I felt like labels started looking further down south after seeing the fact that Outkast could do it. And Outkast sure. did it off of a a single on a, a Christmas album, the Face Christmas album, and then they pushed their they record right off of that. So the fact that they could go and make that kind of noise off a Christmas album, like yeah. a hip hop Christmas album. Like, no, I don't oh, think I anybody else has ever done that. And then to that add to it, Players Ball was on, right? That was right after Players Ball. Right after, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. It was, and then Players Ball was tough. That was a dope ass record. At Aliens was, of course. And then they came into their own after that with the uh, Quimini and uh, shit. The rep, you know, shit. Quimini, Stankonia, Speaker Box, all of those things, but. To have a group like that and yeah. to watch the progression because Andre 3000 was a, just a, he was a, you know, he was a clever MC, but he wasn't right. as dope as he was until he got older. And to see that dude was just a, when he was younger, was a regular hood nigga talking about the Glock, you know, the Glock that he kept under his seat, you know, and then you found out in the second album, he said no more guns, no more liquor. He was growing up, getting more weirder, obviously, with the, the, the clothing oh, yeah. and the fashion yeah, choices. Erica Badu put that thing on him. That Erica Baduism, And then, as he got weirder, he got doper. But then they could still keep it together because Dre is like a, a I don't want to say typical, but he was the, the representation for the regular dudes in the hood. Right. And you know what? Dre, once upon a time, or uh, Andre, you know, was once upon a time the same dude. He yeah. had this progression. But he was always weird, bro. Like, even when he, on the first two, he would wear turbans and shit, so you could always see that there was something different about him. Like he would wear the regular old player suit, so, you know, guest jeans and shit, but he have a turban on, which was always a little different than everybody else. It's kind of yeah. the shit like uh, when you see Nick uh, Nick Cannon yeah. with the turban. So that's Andre Three Thousand. Hey, history repeats itself. Like it I definitely said. do. But I'm gonna just say side note. I say Lil Boosie. Boop. Damn, your mic don't even work now. Boosie and Webby would have been. One of the hardest <laughs> tandems in the South if Boosie would have never went to jail. Yeah, okay. I mean, they still are one of the hardest tandems in the South, but 
I'm saying they would have been up there if you was have with for sure, for sure. I mean, they Top had five. a whole wave of tandems. Top like five of duos. Two, two, yeah, duos. I would say, in my opinion, in the South, for sure. Well, period. Like, like who? What other duos do you think? Like, uh, I can't think of two other duos. Uh huh. Mob Deep, Mob obviously Deep. the Dog Pound, like that. My my two greatest duos in my hum, humble opinion is the Dog Pound and Outkast. Outkast, yeah, for sure. Cool. And I and it's kind of difficult for me to say. I, I would say Outkast only because they had longevity. But if we going off of like, had longevity and if, I'm talking about like you know like the the I'm talking Grammys about and shit. And dog Pound, you know, like how many how many Dog Pound albums have you listened to outside of like Dog Food? Yeah, not that many. I mean, I listen to them, but not like yeah. that though. But if we're going off of like their early, like the the their classic work, Dog Food, yeah. which is a classic, and let's say like AT Aliens, Quimini, or you know, uh, uh, what was the very first one? Uh, okay. Outcast. Was it, uh, I can't even remember. Just, just we just said it, and it just scared my mind. Southern playlist of Cadillac music. Like if we go with their best works, it's kind of tough to say who's who's yeah. better. But those to me would be the one and two, Clips. or somehow, huh? Clips. clips is definitely on that list. Like if we were doing the top five, clips clips would have to come in like third in my book. Uh, but yeah, I think yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Some definitely some do good duos. But I would definitely keep Outkast up there with Dog Pound. That would be my either my one and my two somehow. Uh, but for that very reason, you know, we talk about the other du duos. Dog Pound was on the West, which had a lot of artists. It was already established. Meth and Rap, Meth and Red, or Mob Deep was already on the East Coast, where they were already established. But then Outkast definitely put the South on, made a big statement by going head up with the East at the Social the uh, Source Awards. So man, I think that they, uh, when we talk about groundbreaking artists. Groundbreaking artistry, you don't get no better than Outkast coming out of the South, and shit. Andre 3000 is just an all-around artist. Period. Like, do be painting, producing. Sure. He plays instruments. He designed uh, fashion design. He got a couple pairs of shoes that he does now. He got a shoe shoe uh, shoe line that he actually designs himself. Oh yeah, I seen it. The, uh, my boy got a couple pairs of them shoes. Yeah, you know he even got that uh, that that uh, overall suit that he had when he played Coachella is at the Smithsonian now. Really? Yep. They they retired that bitch, all of them, because you remember how they all used to have different slogans on them or different sayings. Right, right, right. And they took uh, Smithsonian took all them shits. So he's definitely iconic. So, so I would what is, does this Smith yeah does the Smithsonian do they pay people to put their Artifacts in there is that more so like a donation to art? I have no what idea. That's think? a that's really a good. Uh, I would hope that it was like you know the Smithsonian would have requested it, having seen it might be an iconic thing because that was yeah. really like Andre 3000's comeback after being kind of right. Quiet I, for I know time. some some uh, museum. I mean, a lot of museums pay. That's the point of even investing in art, so you can lease your art to a museum. Oh really? And they that's what most of the time happens. Like when people. They'll do this. They'll they'll get some art, and what they'll do is they'll do one of two things. Mm -hmm. They'll say, I'm going to get this art, and I'm going to use it as an investment. And I got this super expensive art piece, and I know all these galleries want to display my, my, my art piece. So I'm going to charge you guys this lump sum, or I'm going to charge you guys this much monthly. Or what people do is say if I'm rich, and say if you have an establishment, right, then a nonprofit. What I'm going to do is I'm going to buy the piece of art. Then I'm going to write in the contract to you that this piece of art is to be yours when I die. Mm, okay. But it stays in my possession until then. Gotcha. So I can do whatever I want. But when I die, it immediately gets handed over to your company. So it gets written off as a tax write-off in the beginning just because it's a purchase for a donation. So all the years you live in, you got a tax write-off that you can make money off of legally. Gotcha. So that's how people lease art and lease paint if you guys didn't know. Lease paintings if you guys didn't know. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Now you put me up on game on that. I'm sure definitely the uh, people that are watching. So, you know, uh, I and think. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments too, please. But, oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. We we invite we invite all of that. All of the uh, critique. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You also have uh 
an idea of someone who you were, someone or some group or some entity that you would uh, consider to be groundbreaking in this hip hop game? Oh yeah, for sure. Like me being an entrepreneur, I for sure saw many of them, but um, just so I wouldn't be West Coast biased. I didn't want to choose E40 or Too Short or somebody like that or like right. Ice Cube. It would have been too easy, but I chose Master P. So definitely because um, I feel like Master P is a true innovator and a trendsetter. Absolutely. And is not afraid about what people say, and he cl- he pays close attention to marketing techniques mm-hmm. and distribution techniques. Because when I look back at it, you know they say hindsight is twenty twenty. Right. So even oh yeah, pause. <laughs> when I look when I look at the whole situation, it's more so like you look at Lil Romeo. That was really a playoff, Lil Bow Wow. Like he yeah, just took that yeah. whole formula. Mm-hmm. Instilled that in Lil Romeo, put the songs out there. Lil Romeo grossed X amount of money from it. Right. He played basketball. He had a travel basketball team. He came out with basketball jerseys. The P. Miller brand came following after a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, and I'm not even going to say, I don't even think he was following trends. I just think that he was so much of a self-funded entity mm-hmm. that sometimes... You can't put it out as fast as the Sean Johns who have worldwide partnerships and that they who Macy's owns the brand now and shit like that, you know? So, um, yeah, I just think Master P is like a true innovator and like a hustler and the ultimate entrepreneur just to see what he was able to do turning down a million dollars from Jimmy Iovine and hopping back on a plane and saying, fuck it, in that climate back then, like now, turning down a million dollars won't have the same type of um, effect because it's known that these record deals are bogus. Mm. Back then, it was like, oh, you want to change your life? You need to fuck with this. So for Master P that had the willpower to say no, you know what I'm saying, and walk away from it, that shows a lot. And then just what he was doing back then, like I watched the, I watched the, um, the old DVDs, the No Limit DVDs and shit all the time. And like, you'll see them self-funded buses, whole bus wrapped. Mm-hmm. They touring state to state to state to state. Everybody on the bus, everybody hand to hand marketing, they promo and everybody in uniform. So it's like he knew what he was doing the whole time. And that just comes from him being an adequate leader and then him also having the business acumen and mindset to be able to develop these new practices and techniques way back when before it was even popular, before the internet could show you how somebody else did something. He was coming up with this damn near on his own. I'm not going to say. I've heard different stories about where, like, he got the ice cream man shit from, about the niggas in the Bay and shit like that. You talk to a nigga from the Bay, they'll say, like, he for sure stole that from E-40. E-40, for sure, for sure. But, um, yeah. I mean, have you you ever heard him say anything about it? Who, E-40? Nah, uh, Master P, like, where he got it? Uh, I mean, he said something slightly, like, the nigga was selling dope. He was calling himself the ice cream man, selling dope (laughs) out the CD store type shit. Yeah, right. it's tricky. Right. Like you said, it's tricky because it's very tricky because he was definitely out in the bay at that time. Right. You so know, of course that's the whole. That's, but again, you can say the same thing about Snoop if you want to. You feel me? Like Snoop got the pimp and shit from the niggas in the bay. Yeah. Like for sure, for sure, got that. You understand me? And that whole little lingo. That's from you know what I'm saying. That's from the bay. That's not really like no unless you a real pimp like. You're not really talking like that in L.A. for, for sure, for sure. More so, they talking like that in the Bay all the time. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I definitely see uh, Master P as a uh, groundbreaking, ain't even fair. Like, that nigga really showed the world how to how to get it. Right. On a, uh, from, on a straight come up. Like, dude took yeah. insurance money. Like, insurance money, I think it was 10000 opened up the shop. And then on a bigger level, what he did was, you know, back then it was sound scan. That's how you got your deal. You, if you showed that you pushed X amount of units in the right. streets, you know, or leverage, leverage, right? Generation. So you know, like it was different than, let's say, Too Short, Ty Shaw. He pushed him out the out the uh, trunk. Yeah. So his his he didn't have numbers per se. He just had receipts for things that he pressed right. up. So like he said, he could go and say, I pressed up a hundred thousand, and they sold took them all on, and sold all of them. Right. So and they were taking for his word because. He was literally pushing around Oakland. Um, well, Lewis, well, in Master P, he had a store where he could scan barcodes. So you you come in, you buy, he might scan too. You know? right. And so he played the system. So he scanned, sound scan for an artist with 
out of Oakland was definitely looking good and yeah. knew his worth, like you said. Turned down a million from Jimmy Iovine, knowing that if they're going to give me a million, I got to be worth much more. And had the wherewithal to say, even though I think he said he only had $500 in his pocket, yeah. turned down a million for much more. Otherwise, if we'd have got that, if he'd have took that million, we wouldn't have had this conversation. Master P would have just been an artist. For sure. You know what I mean? No and limit wouldn't have really been a thing like that. Nope. He wouldn't have had the opportunity. Shit. What? What's... He got High Boys. He got I Got the Hookup. Those two movies are two classics automatically. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, what? I mean, he, of course, he got more movies, but... I can't... Yeah, he got High Boys. Uh, I Got the Hookup. He, I, there's one more that I, I can't remember off the top, but not to mention the, all the m- m- artists he put out, and right. I've never heard anybody say that he gave him a bad deal. Right. He got yeah. to put on his brothers. Yeah. He even got to put on a, one of his brothers that had no rhythm. Like, the Silver fact that he Shocker. made Shock, Silver uh, Shocker uh, uh, a household name at that period of time, yeah. and people fuck with it, the fact that that's, that lends to his genius. And he gave and gave Snoop somewhere to recoup and get his mind right. Man, he gave Snoop. He gave Snoop protection, bro. That's really what he did. Snoop went down there to protect himself against all of the shit that was going on. Run, you know, Shug Knight at the time. Yeah. So he went to New Orleans, you telling me. He went because there was not too many niggas that was like so. not afraid of Shug Knight in the industry at that time. Right. Master P was a real nigga, so you can't. Right. Shug wasn't going to punk him because that nigga come. Master P would come with an entourage and he a real nigga. Like, right. there's stories. Master P didn't let niggas punk him. He was a real nigga, so you you talk about the rest of these niggas in the industry was scared of shit. Yeah. shit. He couldn't have gone nowhere else to get like real protection, real protection, real, real amnesty, real yeah. And they, oh, and, and then you you could listen to uh, some of the interviews that Master P said how Shug kind of Shug might have felt him out at first to see if he could punk him. He he figured out quick that he no couldn't. No bueno. And he had to say he had to let Snoop go. And couldn't couldn't press him because Master P basically had his back. Right. So really, Master P saved that nigga life. Yeah, saved his, his life, saved his le- his life and his career. Cause you see that you see that that next album, Top Dre album jumped back. Go, Dre Tyler. jumped back on board. That's when they had their reunion back in the studio again. Put him out. Shit went multi platinum. Right, he fit right at home. And he puts, you know, he didn't give him a bad deal, so he actually had a better deal, no limit, than he had at Death Row. Much better deal. You right about that? So Master P was shit, really on some real shit. Nigga was a hero, but you know, like you said, he had the wherewithal to to uh, include all his family, even his son, yeah. get that kid money, and set his son up so much so that he got still got longevity. His you son know, son got money too though. Got money. Yeah. Make sure his kids went to college. Make sure those in films, all that Film. type of shit. They got films on Disney, on fucking Nickelodeon, all type of shit. Mm-hmm. So they all getting checks. And a lot of that was him uh, putting up money for it. So you think about the residuals he gonna get back. He didn't have to take money from Full, the front, front end money. So he's getting big checks on the back end. So even though he might not be all irrelevant, dude still got money. You still see him. He's still doing yeah. well. And he put on his family. He put them in a good situation. Uh, right. and he got the uh the new movie about to come out. I got to go too. I, I I can't wait for that shit. I hope it's uh I hope it turns out really good. He definitely reached out. That's another thing that I like about it is that he didn't just go and get big names. He went and got all the young names. Right, he got all the young people that's gonna do the thing and that's gonna attract the the millennial audience. Yep. And bring everybody back into it. Yeah, I I you know I wish him the uh most uh, success. I hope he keep doing it. I definitely. Uh, you be seeing him up at the uh, downtown too, right? Yeah, I've I seen him a couple times in the uh, embroidery spot I go to. Where you get your act right. Uh, exactly, where I get my shit made at, you know. Yeah. Bro's in there ear hustling on me, but it's all good. <laughs> I'm just playing. Nah, it's all good. <laughs> well, yeah, that's definitely a good little plug for act right. For uh, sure. So, yeah, Master P, Outcast, I think... I think there's no argument. Both of them yeah, are groundbreaking. Yeah, definitely groundbreaking. Uh, awesome. Hip hop history in many different areas. Master P is definitely the mogul. I can't. I honestly can't see too many other moguls that did it like him. Like even you, you put together like Bad Boy, you know Rockefeller, 
they still wasn't the same. Still wasn't the same. He was getting more money than them. Master at that time. P was really like a one man army at the end of the day, kind of like I'm not saying a one man army, but he was more so the brains of operation to where Rockefeller was like three brains. Well, even then, you think about Rockefeller, Diddy, and all the rest of them. They had more involvement for the major labels. P, literally, from if I'm correct, his his uh his deals were literally just distribution, whereas you know the rest of them were kind of like. 50 50s, right, 30, right. you know, 30 70s. Buy that shit back and all that. Yeah. P already owned all his money. He masters. owned it, and his deal was literally one business to another as opposed to having ownership. You know, and, and he said he had dibs on all the cash money before they popped. He just didn't, he didn't take that. Wow. Like, I feel like I remember him saying he could have signed Wayne, uh, work with Manny Fresh, you know, before cash money. So. Well. Master P was the dude, is the dude, still, still definitely give him his props. Outcast, uh, hope that they get another album sometime in the future. Yeah. Some point in life, we definitely want another Outcast, but really, I'll be happy just to see Andre 3000 drop another one of those 24 bar uh, verses on a remix or something, because that dude will be going. But uh, yeah, classic conversations. It's definitely a classic conversation. Top one for us. Oh, uh, yeah, don't forget. Subscribe, comment, like, tell your friends. Subscribe, comment, and like, and then tell their friends too.